Good morning, church. I am um, thankful to be here with you this morning, and I'm blessed to be able to bring this message to you, and I hope that you will also be blessed by it. Would you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, we just uh, are thankful, thankful that we are able to gather together this morning to consider your word, to consider your love for us, to consider all that you have done, and to consider how you have revealed yourself to us. And so I pray that you will bless this time. Whatever is good, we give you the glory, and whatever is not so good, I will take full responsibility for. And so we ask this in the power In the authority of your name, Lord Jesus, amen. So this morning we're going to consider the generosity of God. I think we all have a pretty good idea of what generosity is. But if you go to the dictionary, it's defined as liberal in giving, marked by abundance or ample proportions, or characterized by a noble or kindly spirit. The Jewish community has always taken the responsibility of generosity with great pride. The concept known as tzedakah finds its origin in the Torah. The Hebrew word literally means righteousness, but Hebrew speakers use it in reference to giving and charity. So certainly we should go to the Bible to find passages that show us God's generosity. However, if we want the most clear understanding of God, it's important to consider how Jesus presents his Father. In the 15th chapter of the book of Luke, we find Jesus walking from Galilee towards Jerusalem. He is nearing the end of his earthly ministry. And other than the disciples, he has two different groups that are following along with him. Luke clearly portrays both of these groups as being lost. There were the tax collectors and the sinners who knew that they were lost. But then we have the Pharisees who are self-righteous and refuse to acknowledge that they're lost or even consider that they may be lost. The Pharisees are hostile to Jesus while the tax collectors and the sinners are more open to what he has to say. In this chapter, Jesus speaks about three different parables of things with great value which become lost. The first two are very similar stories. One about a lost sheep and the other about a lost coin. But Jesus builds up to this last story, which has been referred to possibly as the greatest short story of all time. The story is commonly referred to as the parable of the lost or parable, parable of the prodigal son. But more correctly, maybe it should be referred to as the parable of the two lost sons. Or how I would like to call it, the parable of the generous father. This is how the story goes. Once there was a father with two sons. The younger son came to his father and said, Father, don't you think it's time for me to have my share of your estate? In light of the Middle Eastern culture of that time, it was a great offense for a son to ask his father for inheritance. It would have been equivalent to saying, I wish you were already dead. So the father went ahead and distributed between the two sons their inheritance. In the Greek, it says he literally gave them his life. And shortly afterward, the younger son packed up all his belongings and traveled off to see the world. He journeyed to a far-off land where he soon wasted all that he had been given in a binge of extravagant and reckless living. With everything spent, 
and nothing left, he grew hungry because there was a severe famine in the land. And so he begged a farmer in that country to hire him. The farmer hired him and sent him out to feed the pigs. The son was so famished, he was willing even to eat the slop given to the pigs because no one would give him a thing. Tending pigs in that time was degrading to anyone, but especially to a Jew who was forbidden to raise swine. So humiliated, the son finally realized what he was doing, and he thought to himself, there are many workers at my father's house who have all the food that they want. With plenty to spare, they lack nothing. Why am I here dying of hunger, feeding these pigs and eating their slop? I want to go back home to my father's house. And I'll say to him, Father, I was wrong. I have sinned against you. I'll never again be worthy to be called your son. Please, Father, just treat me like one of your employees. So the son set off for home. And from a long distance away, the father saw him coming, dressed as a beggar, and great compassion swelled up in his heart for his son who was returning home. The father raced out to meet him, swept him up in his arms, and hugged him dearly and kissed him over and over with tender love. Then he said, the son said, Father, I was wrong. I have sinned against you, and I could never deserve to be called your son. Just let me be. The father interrupted him and said, Son, you're home now. Turning to his servants, the father said, Quick, bring me the best robe, my very own robe, and I will place it on his shoulders. Bring me the ring, the seal of sonship, and I will put it on his finger. Culturally, this ring was an emblem of authority, a seal of sonship giving the authority to transact business in his father's name. Actually, this was a picture of the seal of the Holy Spirit that's placed upon each one of us. And the father went on to say, and bring out the best shoes you can find for my son. In those days, slaves did not wear shoes. He was showing his son that he's not going to be one of his employees or a slave, that he was a, his son. Let's prepare a great feast and celebrate, for my beloved son was once dead, and now he's alive. Once he was lost, but now he is found. And everyone celebrated with overflowing joy. Now the older son was out working in the field when the brother returned. And as he approached the house, he heard the music of celebration and dancing. And he called over to one of the servants and asked, What's going on? The servant replied, It's your brother, your younger brother. He's returned home. And your father's throwing a party to celebrate his homecoming. The older son became angry and refused to go in and celebrate. So his father came out and pleaded with him, come, enjoy the feast with us. You see, in this culture, the culture of this era, hospitality was of a supreme importance. To refuse to go into the feast when it was his responsibility to, to culturally co-host the event with his father was a humiliating rejection to his father. The son said, Father, listen. How many years have I worked like a slave for you, performing every duty you've ever asked as a faithful son? You see, while the younger brother 
pursued self-discovery. The older brother believed in moral conformity, earning favor from his father. Both needed the revelation of grace. And the son went on to say, I have never once disobeyed you, but you've never thrown a party for me because of my faithfulness. Never once have you even given me a goat that I could feast on with my friends and celebrate as this son of yours is doing now. Look at him. He comes back after wasting your wealth on prostitutes and reckless living. And here you are throwing him a great feast to celebrate for him? The father said, My son, you are always with me by my side. Everything I have is yours to enjoy. It's only right to rejoice and celebrate like this because your brother was once dead and gone but now he's alive and back with us again. He was lost, but now he's found. So the false narrative that we are going to consider this morning as it applies to God is that you must earn his favor. Many people believe that love and forgiveness are commodities that are received in turn for our performance. The belief is that God's love, acceptance, and forgiveness must be merited by right living. Certainly, God does not want us to sin. And that is because he knows that sin harms us and those around us. But also, Acts of goodness are healing for both us and to those who receive the goodness. Consider the younger son in this story. He did nothing that we read of that earned his early inheritance. Other than simply being the father's beloved son. The father, despite what he knew would have been best, generously provided the son with his share. And notice, the father did not give with caveats to the son. The father clearly illustrates God's love. His love allowed rebellion, and in some sense allowed human will. The father knew that the son made a foolish and greedy request, yet allowed him to go his course Nonetheless, there is even a sense that the son was tired of living under the father's rules. He wanted to go out and live life the way he wanted to live. He wanted to make his own way and his own decisions. The generosity of this father is extraordinary. I would have expected the father to tell the son something like this. Get lost. Now I'm not going to give you anything. But that's not the way it went. The father simply divided all that was his and gave it to his sons. And the son went out to experience the world in which he so desired, the wealth in which he had put his trust upon, soon runs out. And it is, it is at that point that the son begins to realize the truths of the world. A great famine was affecting the land in which he was staying. But don't you know that there's always a famine in the world? When you choose to leave your father's provision, Instantly, you begin to realize your needs in ways that you never had before. And then there's the community that would have been watching all of this unfold. Can you imagine how embarrassing it would have been for the father 
as everyone looked on, shaking their heads in disbelief, as the young son sold off the land that had been given to him, and maybe even hawked the family items to get that cash that he wanted. Some may have wondered why the father would have even allowed for such recklessness. Well, this all sets the stage to highlight the father's generosity. The thing that I think is most remarkable in the way that the father accepts the son is the way this father accepts the son when he returns. The son had changed from the prodigal to the penitent son. The story indicates that from afar off, the father saw him coming. You see, the father never stopped looking. He never stopped hoping for his son to return. The intensity of the father's reception was indicated by the fact that he ran, which is unusual for a grown man in that culture. And then he repeatedly kissed his son. He is met with hugs and kisses, not with a, well, what do you have to say for yourself now? Or, boy, you stink. Go clean yourself up first. Then we're going to have a talk. The father immediately brings the son back into right sonship. Making him again a steward over all that he has. None of the four things brought to the son were necessities. They were all meant to honor the son and make him know he was loved. The father did much more than merely meet the son's needs. Is there any greater example of forgiveness and trust? The father is overjoyed to have his lost son back and throws a tremendous celebration. He allowed for the past to rest and focused on the plans that he held for his son all along. Then enters the older brother. Coming in from a long day of work, probably dirty, probably tired, and maybe even a little cranky. And what does he discover? His no good for nothing, scoundrel of a brother, is back after wasting all of his cash. There was no way he was going to be part of that. Like the older son, we live in a culture that weighs heavily upon the narrative of earning favor. If you want to obtain things, you must earn them. Early on in our lives, we learned that our parents' love could be impacted by our good or our bad behavior. Our school grades were given based on our academic performance. We might have even learned that affection is offered based on attractiveness. And we may have learned that rejection, loneliness, isolation are consequences of failure. But we don't see this story validated in the narrative that Jesus told us. James Bryan Smith, the author of the book that we're reading, Good and Beautiful God, says this, when every person in every situation in every day of our lives treat us on the basis of how we look, act, and perform, it is difficult not to project that onto God. And I agree with him. So whether we realize it or not, guilt, fear, shame, and desire for acceptance become the primary motivators in our performance-based culture. However, as we look at the biblical story as a whole, we see a larger narrative of grace 
and generosity on behalf of God. We read over and over again in the Psalms, Oh, give thanks to God of heaven for his steadfast love endures forever. How long does God's steadfast love endure? Forever. Praise God. The main narrative of the Bible is the story of steadfast love of God that culminates in the incarnation, death, and resurrection of God on behalf of a wayward world. With this in mind, we should interpret the entire Bible and each of its parts in light of Jesus. The narrative that Jesus is trying to show us is that God is a generous God. His grace, which he freely lavishes upon us, has nothing to do with earning, justice, or fairness. I remember watching a movie in the late 1990s entitled Saving, Saving Private Ryan. In this movie, Matt Damon played Private First Class James Francis Ryan, and Tom Hanks played Captain John H. Miller. The movie takes place during World War II, and the beginning scene portrays the difficult realities of the U.S. Army landing on Omaha Beach in the Normandy invasion. At some point during this battle, Private Ryan goes missing behind enemy lines. He is one of four sons of a family who were drafted into the military. It was found that James Ryan's older brothers had all been killed within a short time during this war. And Ryan was the only son left in that family. The military leaders decided that they needed to find Private Ryan and send him home to his grieving family. Captain Miller is tasked with the mission. And needless to say, the team found Private Ryan. He was near the battlefront, and they began a tactical retreat to bring him home safely. Many of the men on the rescue team lost their lives. One last battle ensues, and Captain Miller is mortally wounded. And before he dies, Captain Miller is face to face with Private Ryan. And looking him in the eyes, he says, earn this, earn it. The movie then flashes many years into the future, portraying a civil, civilianized elderly Private Ryan. They're at the Normandy Cemetery overlooking Omaha Beach with his family standing amongst a sea of white headstones. He had gone to visit the grave of Captain Miller, and he recalls what Captain Miller had told him many years before, and he begins to question whether his life would have earned Miller's approval. Ryan said, every day I think about what you said to me that day on the bridge, and I've tried to live my life the best I could. I hope that was enough. I hope, at least in your eyes, I've earned what all you have done for me. You can tell that he has struggled throughout his life, trying to earn it. But he doesn't really know for sure if he's measured up. At this point, Ryan's wife walks up and he asks her, tell me, tell me I've lived a good life. Tell me I'm a good man. You see, many people live their lives believing in Jesus, but also believing that they have to earn what he did for them on the cross and wonder if they measure up living with the guilt of decisions that can't measure up? Well, Jesus has an answer. As he was hanging on that cross, just before he gave his life for us, he said something that should bring peace and rest into your striving hearts. Jesus said, it is finished. 
He did it all. There is nothing left to add, nothing left to earn. And I can picture Jesus saying this, looking you and me in the eyes and saying, receive this, receive it. Receive that truth, receive his grace, and receive his rest, and receive it abundantly. God's grace is like the great Niagara Falls, and we go to it so thirsty for a drink, yet take only a little Dixie cup full. Receive his grace, receive his generosity, and walk right into that waterfall and be drenched. Soak up as much as you can. The God that Jesus reveals to us runs counter to the way we are wired to think. Brennan Manning, a 20th century Christian author, once said, Jesus reveals a God who does not demand, but who gives who does not oppress, but who raises up, who does not condemn, but forgives. The God Jesus knows is utterly generous. God is generous because he exists in a state of abundance. His provisions can never run out. And God is moved with compassion because he sees our need. God is constantly generous What do you have that the Lord did not provide? We read about God's generous grace in 2 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4, which say, Everything we could ever need for life and godliness has already been deposited in us by his divine power. For all this was lavished upon us through the rich experience of knowing him who has called us by name and invited us to come to him through a glorious manifestation of his goodness. And as a result of this, he has given you magnificent promises that are beyond all price so that through the power of these tremendous promises, we can experience partnership with the divine nature by which you have escaped the corrupt desires of the world. In reality, we are simply stewards to all that God has entrusted to us. Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10 and 11, confirms this by saying, This generous God who supplies abundant seed for the farmer, which becomes bread for our meals, is even more extravagant towards you, First, he supplies every need plus more. Then he multiplies the seed as you sow it so that the harvest of your generosity will grow. You will abundantly be enriched in every way as you give generously on every occasion. For when we take your gifts to those in need, it causes many to give thanks to God. With God, Like the sons in the story, we don't get what we deserve. We get what we don't deserve, which is God's amazing mercy and grace. Our love for God does not determine God's attitude towards us. God loves first, and we see that clearly in God's Son offering his life in order to reconcile us to God. And that love should propel us to love God and love others in return. God first loved us and will never stop loving us. What God wants most from us is not improved moral behavior, but to love him because he first loves us. And then, by his grace, we are transformed to be like him and to walk in his ways. I will close with this story. It's a great example of God's generous heart. After suffering years with a failing liver, Brenda Jones learned that she would need a liver transplant to survive. 
Though she was 69 years old, she wanted to live many more years. And by all accounts, with a healthy liver, she could. So the doctors placed her on a liver transplant list, hoping a donor would eventually appear. Brenda waited a full year before she received the call from her doctor that a match had been found. Thankful that a donor liver had been found, Brenda began to plan her transplant surgery with great anticipation. But before the procedure was performed, she received another call. The second call was also from her transplant surgeon at Baylor. He told Brenda about a 23-year-old woman, Abigail Flores, who had been flown into the hospital that day. Abigail needed a liver transplant as well. And without it, she would die in 24 hours. And most importantly, the liver that was a donor match for Brenda was also a match for Abigail. The choice was up to Brenda, but she did not hesitate. She gave permission for the surgical team to give the liver to Abigail, and as a result, Abigail survived. It was one of the most profound acts of generosity ever witnessed, and Brenda affected numerous lives in the process. And as luck would have it, or as I would say, as God would have it, Brenda was notified four days later that another liver for her had been found. What a tremendous and selfless decision Brenda made. She did not think of herself, but simply saw a need and did what she could do to meet that need, even at the expense of her own welfare. This is love, brothers and sisters. She didn't know Abigail, but she loved Abigail. If you still have reservations of God's generosity, then I encourage you to look to the cross where a loving God hung in the place of a sinful and prideful, rebellious people with nothing but love in his eyes and asking for nothing but for us to receive what he has done and live a life of abiding faith in him.